an odd thing it is to be a thief and to burglarize a home. I'm not doing it for the septums, as I have a sum approaching 150,000 gold at the moment. I also own my own home, two of them, Frostcrag Spire and the other Arbor Watch and Coral. I also have my own horse, and the best equipment for an adventuring battle mage that can be found anywhere on Nurn. So clearly I'm not robbing people because I need the septums. I am doing it because I need to get into a higher ranking for the Thieves Guild so that they will continue to offer me more work. The last job they had me do was quite excellent. I robbed Hieronymus Lex himself. So yes, let's keep that up and continue hitting that fool that has made their and my lives so miserable for about a decade. It was exciting, I'll say that. I have no intention of harming anyone, and it is rare to find anything of worth when I do these things, but it certainly does keep one on their toes. I see how some thieves enjoy this kind of life. But I'm not stupid. My sister lost her life while working for the Thieves Guild. Keep on defying the law and one day you will get caught. The Thieves Guild may be good to have survived for centuries, but their members do often make mistakes, and the Imperial Guard then swoops down upon them. I'm just fortunate that I wasn't recognized, and the guards called when I was caught in Tudius Sextius' home. Well, it seems like Preville will keep me busy for a while longer. I am now helping some Altmer mage named Narastero. He requires a long escort back to Skingrad, and here we are just south of Leowen. I know the roads, and there will be trouble along them, no doubt. But I pray to the Nine that it will be minimal. We have to do this quickly and then come back to Breville for the other jobs. I haven't even met with the Count of Breville yet. <sighs> yes, this escort will keep me busy for a while. Let's just get it over with. The Arcane University is calling to me, and the longer Breville takes for me to get through the work there, the longer I'm being held back from what I really want to do. And no, teleportation to my... Frostcrag Spire will not work with him. I'd like to spend some time just looking at them. Yes, flowers around Skingrad. We will do that one day. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we have to go to Skingrad. Now, I hope this will be an uneventful trip. Now, I plan to take this route along this road past Breville. Uh, then the road goes up this way. Why can't it just make a straight line here? Hmm. Okay, so we'll just take the main road. And hopefully, we won't run into any problems. No gates. No Daedra. Here we go.
I have lumps and bruises from long process, practice sessions with all kinds of maces and axes. I am now an expert with blunt weapons. My sweeping power attack now has a chance to knock down my opponent. I hear Nernroot. Yes, I killed her. And maybe that was an accident, but she was trying to kill Wolfgang. I'm not, not going to allow that to happen. Let's go. Daisies. <coughs> like to stop running into problems along the road. Get on your horse! Hey! She was a stupid orc, anyways. Don't attack my wolf. Alright, let's be off again.
Well, as you can see, we made it. There were problems along the road. Lots of bandits and other creatures. Though, yeah, the guards even came after you for a moment there. I had to break it up. And get Fergus out of there, too. But we've all made it. Let's go into Skingrad. Not to mention I killed that orc. I don't know why. I don't exactly feel bad about doing it. I just feel... Different. Well, we're here. Yes? Is there a problem? I guess you want to go right back to your home. I'll be right behind you. Uh, should let you know that your home has been trashed. And uh, not by me. By the necromancers that had taken it over. Yeah, of course he's slow. Even on my f on foot, I'm way faster than he is. So, we left around 8 in the morning, it's now 7 p.m. Hmm. Not even a day to get from Leowen to Skingrad. And we started out further from Leowen, actually. Which was your house? It was one of these, wasn't it? Oh, maybe he wants to go to the West Wheel Inn? Greetings. Okay. That's at the end here. Bolivian Traders and the West Wheel End is here. I don't know who he's going to stay with. I don't know how to thank you. You have a good heart to help me get back home. I'll never forget what you've done for me. All right. Here, please take this as a token of our friendship. Perhaps it will help you in the future. Thank you. Now, uh, you've over uncovered me. Yeah. Lilia, I need your help with some of this weight. We'll have to maybe even stay the night here, and then we can go and sell in the morning. Sell all the loot I picked up, mostly from that orc. All right, well, we rest. It's not that late. Well, if you want to get me a drink, or have one yourself, go ahead. But I will, with the little light that we have, read another book. Actually, I really should heal myself. Uh, I was hurting. All right. Now, what book do we have? Oh, yes, the third, third book for the series. The Real Queen Baron Zaya, Part 3. For several days, Baron Zaya felt a weight of sorrow at her separation from her friends. But by the second week out, her spirits began to rise a little. She found that she enjoyed being on the road again, although she missed Straw's companionship more than she would have thought. They were escorted by a troop of Red Guard knights with whom she felt comfortable, although these were much more disciplined and decorous than the guards of the merchant caravan she had spent time with. They were genial but respectful toward her despite her attempts at flirtation. She'll flirt with anybody, at any time. Symmachus scolded her privately, saying a queen must maintain royal dignity at all times. You mean I'm never allowed to have any fun, she inquired petulantly. Aye, not with such as these. They are beneath you. Graciousness is to be desired from those in authority. My lady, familiarity is not. You will remain chaste and modest while you are at the Imperial City. Baron Zaya may have made a face. I might as well be back at Darkmoor Keep. Elves are promiscuous by nature, you know. Everyone says so. Everyone is wrong, then. Some are, some aren't. The Emperor... And I expect you to display both discrimination and good taste. Let me remind you, your highness, that you hold the throne of Mournhold not by right of blood, but solely at the pleasure of Tiber Septim. If he judges you unsuitable, your reign will end ere it begins. He requires intelligence, obedience, discretion, and total loyalty of all his appointees, and he favors chastity and modesty in women. I suggest, strongly suggest you model your deportment after our good Drelian, my lady. 
I'd as leaf be back in Darkmoor, Baron's eyes snapped resentfully, offended at the thought of emulating the frigid, prudish Drelian in any way. That is not an option, your highness. You are of no use to Cyrus Septum. He will, not, he will see to it that you are of no use to his enemies either. The general said portentously, If you would keep your head on your shoulders, take heed. Let me add that power offers pleasures other than those of carnality and convorting with base company. He began to speak of art, literature, drama, music, and the grand balls thrown at the imperial court. Baron Zaya listened with growing interest, spurred on not entirely by his threats, but afterwards she asked timidly if she might continue her study of magic while at the imperial city. Simacus seemed pleased at this and promised to arrange it. Encouraged, she then said that she noted three of their knights' escort were women and asked if she might train a little with them just for the sake of exercise. The general looked less delighted at this but gave his consent, though stressing it would only be with the women. The late winter weather held fair, though slightly frosty, for the rest of their journey so that they traveled quickly over firm roads. On the last day of their trip, spring seemed to have arrived at last for there were hints of a thaw. The road quickly grew muddy underfoot and everywhere one could hear water trickling and dripping faintly but steadily. It was a welcome sound. They came to the great bridge that crossed into the imperial city at sunset. The rosy glow turned the stark white marble edifices of the metropolis a delicate pink. It all looked very new and grand and immaculate. A broad avenue led north towards the palace. A crowd of people, all sorts and races, filled the wide concourse. Lights winked out in the shops and on in the inns as dusk fell and stars came out singly, then by twos and threes. Even the side streets were broad and brightly illuminated. Near the palace, the towers of an immense mage's guild hall reared towards the east, while westward the stained glass windows of a huge tabernacle glittered in the dying light. Symmachus had apartments in a magnificent house two blocks from the palace, past the temple, the Temple of the One. He identified as they passed it, an ancient Nordic cult which Tiber Septim had revived. He said that Baron Zaya would be expected to become a member should she prove acceptable to the Emperor. The place was quite splendid, although little to Baron Zaya's taste. The walls and furnishings were done in utter pristine white, relieved only by touches of dull gold, and the floors in dully gleaming black marble. Baron Zaya's eyes ached for color and the interplay of subtle shadings. In the morning, Symmachus and Drelian escorted her to the Imperial Palace. Baron Zaya noted that everyone they met greeted Symmachus with a deferential respect, in some cases bordering on obsequiousness. The general seemed to take it for granted. They were ushered directly into the imperial presence. The morning sun flooded a small room through a large window with tiny panes, washing over a sumptuously laden breakfast table and the single man who sat there, dark against the light. He leaped to his feet as he entered and hurried toward them. Ah, Symmachus, our most loyal friend, we welcome your return most gladly. His hands held Symmachus's shoulders briefly, fondly, halting the deep genuflection the dark elf had been in the process of effecting. Baron Zaya curtsied as Tiber Septim turned to her. Baron Zaya, our naughty little runaway, how do you do, child? Here, let us have a look at you. Why, Symmachus, she's charming, absolutely charming. Wait, wait this is Tiber... Tiber Septim, which one, though? Wasn't this in the past? It'd have to be, because her son's not even born... I believe her son's older than me, so this isn't the current emperor. If it was, he was very young. But anyways, um... Why, Samachus, she's charming. Absolutely charming. Why have you hidden her from us all these years? Is the light too much, child? Shall we draw the hangings? Yes, of course, he waved aside Samachus' protests and drew the curtains himself, not troubling to summon a servant. You will pardon us for this discourtesy towards yourselves, our dear guests. We've much to think of, though that scant excuse for hospitality's neglect. But, ah, uh, pray join us. There's some excellent nectarines from Black Marsh. They settled themselves at the table. Baron Zaya was dumbfounded. Tiber Septon was nothing like the grim, gray, giant warrior she pictured. He was of average height, fully half a head shorter than tall Symmachus, although he was well-knit of figure and lithe of movement. He had a winning smile, bright 
indeed piercing blue eyes, and a full head of stark white hair above a lined and weathered face. He might have been any age from 40 to 60. He pressed food and drink upon them, then repeated the question the general had asked her days ago. Why had she left home? Had her guardians been unkind to her? No, Excellency, Baron's eye replied. In truth, no, although I fancied so at times. Symmachus had fabricated a story for her, and Baron Zaya told it now, although with a certain misgiving. The stable boy, Straw, had convinced her that her guardians, unable to find a suitable husband for her, meant to sell her off as a concubine in rehab, and when a red guard had indeed come, she had panicked and fled with Straw. Tiber Septim seemed fascinated and listened raptly as she provided details of her life as a merchant caravan escort. Why, tis like a ballad, he said. By the one, you'll we'll have the court bard set it to music. What a charming boy you must have made. <laughs> General Simacus said, Baron's eyes stopped in some confusion, then proceeded. He said, well, that I no longer look much like a boy. I have grown in the past few months. She lowered her, ha her gaze in what she hoped approximated maidenly modesty. He's a very discerning fellow, is our loyal friend Simacus. I know I've been a very foolish girl, Excellency. I must crave your pardon, and that of my kind guardians. I, I realized that some time ago, but I was too ashamed to go back home. But I don't want to return to Darkmoor now, Excellency. I long for Mournhold. My soul pines for my own country. Our dear child, you shall go home, we promise you. But we pray you remain with us a little longer, that you may prepare yourself for the grave and solemn task with which we shall charge you. Baron Zaya gazed at him earnestly, heart beating fast. It was all working just as Symmachus had said it would. She felt a warm flush of gratitude towards him, but was careful to keep her attention focused on the Emperor. I am honored, Excellency, and wish most earnestly to serve you and this great empire you have built in any way I can. It was the polite thing to say, to be sure. But Baron Zaya really meant it. She was awed at the magnificence of the city and the discipline and order evident everywhere, and moreover was excited at the prospect of being a part of it all. And she felt quite taken by the gentle Tiber Septum. After a few days, Symmachus left for Mornhold to take up the duties of a governor until Baron Zaya was ready to assume the throne, after which he would become her prime minister. Baron Zaya, with Drelian as chaperone, took up residence in a suite of rooms at the Imperial Palace. Several tutors were provided her, in all the fields deemed seemly for a queenly education. During this time, she became deeply interested in the magical arts, but she found the study of history and politics not at all to her preference. <laughs> Actually, I like all three. Especially history. Politics are just currently what is happening, and tomorrow it will be recorded as history. On occasion, she met with Tiber Septum in the palace gardens, and he would unfailingly and politely inquire as to her progress, and chide her, although with a smile, for her disinterest at matters of state. However, he was always happy to instruct her on the finer points of magic, and he could make even history and politics seem interesting. They're people, child, not dry facts in a dusty volume, he said. Exactly, they're people. It's history, is. Politics, history, this is the stories of what's happened and what is happening. The conflicts that have happened yesterday and what are going on today. As her understanding broadened, her their discussions grew longer, deeper, more frequent. He spoke to her of his vision of a united Tamriel, each race separate and distinct but with shared ideals and goals, all contributing to the common wheel. Some things are universal, shared by all sentient folk of goodwill, he said. So the one teaches us. We must unite against the malicious and the brutish, the miscreated, the orcs, trolls, goblins, and other worse creatures, and not strive against one another. Hmm. I think I really like this emperor. I don't know if this is Uriel the Seventh, though. It just says Tiber Septum. Uh, couldn't have been the first one, could it? Maybe it was. I don't know. Gentle Tiber Septum. He it will be Uriel Septim the Seventh. So I think this was around the time that the Third Era just had begun, or right before it. Maybe I'd have to go back to the first book and, and read. It might have said uh, at the end of the Second Era. I don't know. So I think this is the original Tiber Septim. His blue eyes would light up as he stared into his dream, and Baron Zaya was delighted just to sit and listen to him. If he drew close to her, the side of her, her body next to him would glow as if she were he were a, a smoldering blaze. 
If their hands met, she would tingle all over as if his body were charged with a shock spell. Seems like she's growing, starting to fancy the Emperor. One day, quite unexpectedly, he took her face in his hands and kissed her gently on the mouth. She drew back after a few moments, astonished by the violence of her feelings, and he apologized instantly. I, we, we didn't mean to do that. It's just, you are so beautiful, dear. So very beautiful. He was looking at her with hopeless yearning in his generous eyes. All right, now I really wish I could see her, see what she looked like back then. I've never seen her. She, when I was in, Mor uh, in Morrowind, she was just in Morhold with her son. Or, no, no, wait, that was before. She, she's there now in Morhold with her son. King Hellseth has taken over. She was yet to return. There was another king at the time. That's right. Um, she turned away, tears streaming down her face. Are you angry with us? Speak to us, please. I notice he uses himself in a plural form. Baron Zaya shook her head. I could never be angry with you, Excellency. I, I love you. I know it's wrong, but I can't help it. We have a consort, he said. She is a good and virtuous woman, the mother of our children and future heirs. We can never put her aside. Yet, there is nothing between us and her. No sharing of the spirit. She would have us be other than what we are. We are the most powerful person all of Tamarel. Tamriel and Berenzaya, we, I, I think I am the most lonely as well. He stood up suddenly. Power, he said with sublime contempt. I'd trade a goodly share of it for youth and love if the gods would only sanction it. Interesting. I wonder if I would ever get to that point to feel that way. But you are strong and vigorous and vital, more than any man I've ever known. He shook his head vehemently. Today, perhaps. Yet I am less than I was yesterday, last year, ten years ago. I feel the sting of my mortality, and it is painful. If I can ease your pain, let me, Baron Zai moved towards him, hands outstretched. No, I would not take your innocence from you. I'm not that innocent. How so? The Emperor's voice suddenly grated harshly, his brows knitted. Baron Zai's mouth went dry. What had she just said? But she couldn't turn back now, he would know. There was straw, she faltered. I... I was lonely too, am lonely, and not so strong as you. She cast her eyes down in abashment. I, I guess I'm not worthy, Excellency. No, no, not so, Baron Zaya, my Baron Zaya. It cannot last for long. You have a duty toward Mornhold and a duty toward the Empire. I must tend towards mine as well. But while we may, shall we share what we have, what we can, and pray the one forgiveness forgive us in our frailty? Tabor Septum held out his arms, and wordlessly, willingly, Baron Zaya stepped into his embrace. I've noticed one uh, topic that continues on in all of these books. Yes, sex. You keep her on the edge of a volcano child, Drelian admonished, as Baron Zaya admired the splendid star sapphire ring her imperial lover had given her to celebrate their one-month anniversary. Really? How so? We make one another happy. We harm no one. Simacus bade me be discriminating and discreet. Who better could I choose? And we've been most discreet. He treats me like a daughter in public. Tabor Septim's nightly visits were made through a secret passage that only few in the palace were privy to, himself and a handful of trusted bodyguards. He slavers over you like a cur, his supper. Have you not noticed the coolness of the Empress and her son toward you? Baron Zaya shrugged. Even before she and Septim had become lovers, she received no more from his family than bare civility. Threadbare civility. What matter? It is Tabor Septim who holds the power. But it is his son who holds the future. Do not put his mother up to public scorn, I beg you. Yes, considering that uh, us men live for only so long compared to Myrrh. But, um... <clears throat> Can I help it if that dry stick of a woman cannot hold her husband's interest, even in conversation at dinner? Have less to say in public, that is all I ask. She matters little, it is true, but her children love her, and you do not want them as enemies. Tabar Septum has not long to live, I mean. Drelian amended quickly as Baron Zaya's scowl. Humans are all short-lived, ephemeral, as we of the Elder Races say. They come and go as the seasons, but the families of the powerful ones live on for a time. You must be a friend to this family, if you would see lasting profit from your relationship. Ah, but how can I make you see truly, you who are so young and human-bred as well? If you take heed and wisely, you and Mornholds are 
Morn Hold are likely to live to see the fall of the Septum Dynasty, if indeed he has founded one, just as you have witnessed its rise. It is the way of human history. They ebb and flow like the inconstant tides. Their cities and dominions bloom like spring flowers, only to wither and die in the summer sun. But the elves endure. We are as a year to their hour, a decade to their day. A bit of an exaggeration, though. Tiber Septim lived for over a century. If he's 40 to 60, he has a long, long life ahead of him still. Baron Zaya just laughed. She knew that rumors abounded about her and Tiber Septim. She enjoyed the attention. For all, save the Empress and her son, seemed captivated by her. Minstrel sang of her dark beauty and her charming ways. She was in fashion and in love. And if it was temporary, well, what was not? She was happy for the first time she could remember. Each of her days filled with joy and pleasure. And the nights were even better. <laughs> I can imagine. Something that I am missing. What is wrong with me, Baron Zaya lamented? Look, not one of my skirts fit. What's become of my wasteland? Am I getting fat? <laughs> Baron Zaya regarded her thin arms and legs and her undeniably thickened waist in the mirror with displeasure. Obviously, the Emperor gave her a child. Drelian shrugged. You appear to be with child, young as you are. Constant pairing with a human has brought you to early fertility. I see no choice but for you to speak with the Emperor about it. You are in his power. It would be best, I think, for you to go directly to Mornhold if he would agree to it and bear the child there. I am not aware of any child that sh she had with the Emperor, but... Alone? Baron Zaya placed her hands on her swollen belly, tears forming in her eyes. Everything in her yearned to share the fruit of her love with her lover. He'll never agree to that. He won't be parted from me now, you'll see. Drelian shook her head. Although she said no more, a look of sympathy and sorrow had replaced her usual cool scorn. That night, Baron Zaya told Tiber Septon when he came to her for their usual... Assignation? With child, he looked shocked. No, stunned. You're sure of it. But I was told elves do not bear at so young an age. Baron Zaya forced a smile. How can I be sure I've never... I shall have my healer fetched. The healer, a high elf of middle years, confirmed that Baron Zaya was indeed pregnant, and that such a thing had never before been known to happen. Hmm? It was a testimony to his excellency's potency, the healer said in psychophantic tones. Tapper Septim roared at him. This must not be, he said. Undo it. We command you. Sire, the healer gaped at him. I cannot. I may not. Of course you can, you incompetent dullard, the emperor snapped. It is our express wish that you do so. Baron Saya. Still, they left out the S, then silent and wide-eyed with terror, suddenly sat up in bed. No, she screamed. No, what are you saying? Child, Tiber Septim sat down beside her, his face wearing one of his winning smiles. I'm so sorry, truly, but this cannot be. Your issue would be a threat to my son and his sons. I shall no more put it plainly than that. The child I bear is yours, she wailed. No, it is now but a possibility, a might be, not yet gifted with a soul or quickened into life. I will not have it so. I forbid it. He gave the healer another hard stare, and the elf began to tremble. Sire, it is her child. Children are few among the elves. No elven woman conceives more than four times, and that is very rare. Two is the usual number. Some bear none, even, and some only one. If I take this one from her, sire, she may not conceive again. You promised us she would not bear to us. We have little faith in your prognostications. Baron Zaya scrambled naked from the bed and ran for the door, not knowing where she was going, only that she could not stay. She never reached it. Darkness overtook her. She awoke to pain and a feeling of emptiness, a void where something used to be, something that used to be alive, but now was dead and gone forever. Drelian was there to soothe the pain and clean up the blood that still pooled at times between her legs, but there was nothing to fill the emptiness. There was nothing to take the place of the void. The Emperor sent magnificent gifts and vast arrangements of flowers and came on short visits, always well attended. Baron Zaya received these visits with pleasure at first, but Tiber Septim came no more at night, and after some time, nor did she wish him to. Some weeks passed, and when she was completely physically recovered, Drelian informed her that Symmachus had written to request she come to Mournhold earlier than planned. It was announced that she would leave forthwith. 
she was given a grand retinue, an extensive trousseau befitting a queen, and an elaborate and impressive ceremonial departure from the gates of the Imperial City. Some people were sorry to see her leave, but expressed their sadness in tears and expostulations. But some others were not, and did not. Yes, the real Baron Zaya, every book must be filled with... <laughs> well, sh sex and all that kind of... Fun stuff. Alright, let's rest. Things that I should be having in my life. Sex and fun stuff. But it's not to be, not yet. It's how they recruit new members. The Dark Brother comes really? to sleep. I keep hearing that. I have no more to say to you. Vilya, it's time for us to sleep. There's no need to be that way. Goodbye. You have the little bed. I have the big one. Let's see, let's sleep for this long. And in the morning we'll be able to go and sell all our loot. You sleep rather soundly for a murderer. I was just that's good. You'll need a clear conscience for what I'm about to propose. Huh? Who are you? Get out of my room! Vilya, why did you allow him to come in? Explain yourself now! In due time, dear child. In due time. First, an introduction. I am Lucian Lachance. I don't really care who you are. Get out of my room. When I'm sleeping, no one interrupts it. And you. You are a cold-blooded killer. Capable of taking life without mercy or remorse. The Night Mother has been watching, and she is most pleased. Are you talking about the orc I killed on the and road? And so, here I am. I come to you with an offering, an opportunity to join our rather unique family. Even Tiber Septim was against the orcs. I don't consider them... I don't consider that murder. I consider it pest extermination. But what are you going on? What opportunity? Tell me. Then heed my words, for I will not repeat them. On the green road to the north of Breville lies the Inn of Ill Omen. I know of it. I passed it by. There you will find a man named Rufio. Kill him, and your initiation into the Dark Brotherhood will be complete. Is this a joke? Do this, and the next time you sleep in a location I deem secure, I will reveal myself once more, bearing the love of your new family. My new family. Please, accept this token from the Dark Brotherhood. It is a virgin blade, and thirst for blood. May it serve you well. As does your silence. Now I bid you farewell. I do hope we'll meet again soon. <laughs> are you really with the Dark Brotherhood, or are you just some fool in a room down the hall playing a prank on me? Have you not heard of the Dark Brotherhood? Everybody has. Are the remorseless guild of paid assassins and homicidal cutthroats. Join us. And you'll find the Dark Brotherhood to be all that and so much more. We are, more than anything, a union of like-minded individuals. We kill for profit, for enjoyment, and for the glory of the Dread Father Sithis. Dread Father Sithis. Daedra. Bonds forged in blood and death. You serve someone called the Night Mother. We praise our unholy matron. From her shadowed womb we were born. From her breast we suckle malice and pain. She loves her children, you see. Okay, you just made it sound all disgusting. Who is this Rufio you want killed? Know that Rufio is old and weak and sleeps his days away. You could kill him before he even has a chance to wake. If you so choose. <laughs> What's this about a speaker? Yes, I am a speaker, a representative of the Dark Brotherhood. My voice is the voice of the Black Hand, our organization's ruling body. One of my duties is to find exceptional individuals, such as yourself, and offer a place 
within our family. Yeah, I don't know how to take this. Maybe I'll sleep on it if you leave me alone. Goodbye. Your path is clear. Send Rufio to his death, and the Dark Brotherhood will embrace you as family. I suggest you leave this room and let me sleep. Well, the fact that he just turned invisible the means he's no ordinary person. Excellent. Excellent. And you, you guard! Are. You just... What's new with you? Goblin. I... I just want to sleep. I'll have to think about this. They seem more like a Daedric cult that commits violence for money. Hmm. Do I really want to be part of such a thing? Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.